know, it is hard enough to do one thing well. Uh, it can be really challenging to do two or more things well. I'll give you a quick example of this. You know, in the realm of professional sports, maybe you've noticed that it is, you can line up the greatest athletes in the world. I mean, if you're playing in a professional sport, automatically you're like in the top, you know, like 99%, you know, top 1%, I guess is how we ought to say it. But it's incredible, their athleticism. And yet, even the greatest athletes in the world, if you were to line them up, you would find very few that can play in more than one professional sport. You, you can put the list out there. You can read the names, but it's very few. That's why whenever I was in high school and going into college, some of these incredible athletes that were two sport athletes were making the headlines. I mean, these were popular guys, guys like Deion Sanders. A lot of you perhaps remember him. He was called Primetime, right? He was a two sport athlete, and he did something that no other athlete had ever done. And that is he played in two professional sports within 24 hours of each other. He was playing for the Atlanta Braves in game four of the 1992 National League Championship Series on a Saturday night. He then jumped on a plane, flew to Miami, where then his, his uh, Atlanta Falcons were going up against the Miami Dolphins on a Sunday afternoon game. It, it was just unheard of. When I was in high school, going into college, guys like this, Bo Jackson, okay, played for the Royals, played for the Raiders, right? He was one of those guys that was the first professional athlete to be named an all-star in two different sports. He was a 1989 all-star game MVP in baseball, and then he was rushing for 554 yards on 81 carries in just seven games for the Raiders. He, he was one of these epitome of somebody who could do two things and do it well, and it's just rare to come across such a thing. Every day we face challenges like this in our own lives. Those of you who are detailed, analytical people may find it difficult if you have to make a really hard decision immediately. It's going to affect a lot of people, but it's got to come now. That might be really challenging for you. Those of you who are spontaneous People, persons, that's who you are by nature, can find it difficult to wade through data as you try to weigh the weaknesses of a system or a strategy to create a new one. There's just some things that, that we do better than, than others. It's, it's easier to do one thing well than to do two things well. And I think you're going to feel the challenge of that a little bit today. You're going to feel the tension of that a little bit today as we open up our Bibles and our devices to the book of First Peter. And if you have a Bible or device, I want you to open up to that book because we've entitled this sermon, Convicted and Compassionate. Convicted and Compassionate. What we discover is that some of us, we, we tend to live with conviction, but we're a little weak with compassion. And others of us, man, we show a lot of love and we show a lot of compassion, but we're kind of weak when it really comes to conviction and standing for what is true and what is right. But what we're going to discover is that if we lean one way too far or we lean the other way too far and we don't see both in our lives, then we're not going to represent Jesus well to the world. And what I want to show us really quick is what happens if we're lacking conviction and what happens if we're lacking compassion, neither of which is good. And here's why. Because conviction without compassion is condemning. Maybe some of you have experienced this before. Unfortunately, it is how most of the world views Christians. Many, much of the world views Christians in this way. And, and it may be an unfair stereotype in many cases. But that stereotype exists because of so many who were living with conviction, but they were lacking compassion, and it came across as condemning. It is the evangelist who stands on our college campuses and calls people names and makes judgmental statements and spews anger and frustration at everyone who passes by. It is those who view unbelievers as wrong instead of as lost. It's those who would rather make a point than make a difference. It's those who would rather condemn than build a bridge. Conviction without compassion has done a lot of damage in the name of Christ. I will talk occasionally to people who have come from homes 
where in those homes it was all about rules and regulations. There was a condemning spirit within the home. They faced the oppression of religion. It was a home where it was about performance and reputation management, but it lacked relationship, which means it lacked grace and love. And when you live in that kind of environment, you are under the oppression of religion. Compassion is missing. And anything we do that is not undergirded with compassion or with love, it misrepresents Jesus to our world. And so, on the one hand, conviction without compassion is condemning. On the other hand, compassion without conviction is condoning. It's condoning. This is where the pendulum swings the other way. And many American churches have done this. Josh McDowell, he talks about the new definition of tolerance in our culture, in our society today. And he says the new definition of tolerance is that every individual's beliefs and values and lifestyles and perception of truth claims is valid or equal. It's equal, even if it contradicts. That means they are all, every truth claim, every one of them. In our culture today, our culture believes that they are equally right and equally true and equally valid, even if they contradict. That is the new tolerance that we just live in. That's just the way things are in our culture. And so if you make a judgment about someone's belief system and say that that one is better than another or one is more credible than another, or if you believe and communicate that someone else's behavior or lifestyle, according to God's word, is morally right or morally wrong, you can be considered intolerant and a bigot. And so people have just come to realize that if they just keep their beliefs to themselves, and if they just abstain from sharing those beliefs with others, then they will face a lot less grief. And they've discovered that if you really want to meet the world's approval, If you really want to show how tolerant and inclusive you are, then not only do you stay silent on those things, but you actually condone them. You must approve of them. Even if they're contrary to what God says, just show love, just show compassion. That that, that is, is what a lot of our churches have moved into in our culture. But in so doing, they've sacrificed conviction. So what I want to do today as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1 is I just want to say that neither extreme works. And God would say conviction and compassion, truth and love are needed. And so as we look at our Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 1, I I just find that it's interesting that that Peter who is writing is a, a man who wrestled with this very thing himself. I mean, if you just look at Peter's life and you go back to when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and Jesus is under duress and at that time uh, Judas comes and portrays Jesus with a kiss and then the temple guards come to arrest Jesus and Peter is right there, man, and he yanks out a sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest and he's going to war and battle with Jesus. He's, he's going to live by conviction. He's going to stand with him. You see Peter in that moment moment taking that kind of action. Or or you see Peter on another occasion when he's before the Sanhedrin after the resurrection of Jesus and they order him to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And Peter says, you know, are we going to obey you or are we going to obey God? We can't help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. Man, he was standing on conviction and standing boldly. And then we see other times in Peter's life when he's struggling He's struggling to show compassion. He's struggling to show grace. And you see him on that occasion when, when he uh, is with the Gentiles and, and, and the Jewish believers. They're all in one spot. And Paul rebukes him because uh, he's showing favoritism. He, he won't eat with the Gentiles out of fear of some of the Jews' prejudice against them. And, and Paul calls him out on it. And Peter was the one who had had the vision from God that the gospel needs to go to the Gentiles. And And he had had all of that, and yet he he was just wrestling with staying true to his convictions in these moments. And he he was just like us. He, He just wrestled with these things. And yet it is Peter, as he continues to grow, inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is Peter who will write for us here in 1 Peter chapter 1. How we are to live with truth and how we are to live with grace. How as outsiders in this world, we're to live with faith. And I know as we've already spent two weeks in this book, and we've uncovered a lot, I want us to look today at 1 Peter chapter 1 and jump down to verse 22 
through 25. And I want us to read this together. And here's what we read. The text says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. I want to pause there just for a minute. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth. You know, the Bible says, how can a young man keep his way pure? It's by obeying his word, by living according to his word. When you live according to the truth, you are purifying yourself. And when you obey the truth, you're going to have a sincere love. They go together, truth and love, conviction and compassion. The two must always be married together. It's essential. In fact, if you know the truth, you're going to have a sincere love for each other. And he says, love one another deeply from the heart. Deeply means intensely. It means with a full stretch, all out love. He says, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And Peter is saying here, you know the truth. You have the truth because of this truth. It is imperishable. You know the seed that was thrown by the sower? You know the word of God that was thrown into your heart? That seed is imperishable. It lasts forever. It endures forever. Though you are not, though people are don't last. They come and go. Though people are like grass and like flowers of the field, they're here one minute and then they're gone the next. Though man-made ideas and man-made religions and man-made belief systems, though they come and they go, even though our mortal bodies come and go, if you have the Word of God in you, if you have the truth in you, you have something that will last forever. You will experience a new birth. You will be born again by the power of God. That word stands forever, and you should stand with conviction on that truth. You don't just believe it. You obey it. I liked how preacher Kyle Eidemann talked about the difference between the world's, I mean, between the word belief and the word conviction. And he says belief is the acceptance of truth, but conviction is is a demonstration of truth. Belief is acceptance of truth, but conviction is a demonstration of truth. In other words, belief is cognitive recognition, but conviction is lived out belief. Conviction is something that you accept. It's not just something you accept, it is something that you show. And what I have discovered, and I think this is why Peter is talking about this, is when you are under pressure, when you're facing opposition, you're going to find out whether you just have belief or whether you've got conviction. Because if it is belief, and that's it, you will tend to go away quietly when the pressure is on. But if it's a conviction, it is something you will continue to show with your life even when the pressure is on. Howard Hendricks put it this way. He said, a belief is something you'll argue about. A conviction is something you'll die for. And what Peter is talking about to these believers who are facing oppression, facing opposition, facing certain levels of persecution, he's saying this better be something that you're willing to die for. You better live this out. Now, in the very first chapter, we've already seen here that Peter is giving us some directives that relate to conviction. He says in verse 13, prepare your minds for action and be self-controlled. In verse 14, he says, as obedient children, do not conform to evil desires. In verse 15, he tells us to be holy in the way that we live. In verse 22 here that we just read, he says, obey the truth. It's through obedience of the truth that he's doing a good work in us. And so what I want to show us today are two reasons that we should live with conviction and compassion, why both are needed. And the first one is this, because living with conviction makes the truth credible. When you live with conviction, it makes the truth credible. Now, my example of this is about 10 minutes before this service started. Okay, this is, this is fresh. This is new. 10 minutes before this service started, I forgot something out in my truck. So I went running out the front doors of the church to get to my vehicle fast because I had a lot to do before this service started. And so I'm running out there, and as I started to cross, our, uh, as soon as I got out from the canopy and was, and was going to cross our little blacktop area there, A large black SUV 
You might be in the room right now. I don't know. I don't know who you are. But a large black SUV was coming about 35 miles per hour through that area. And I was running to my truck, and here they came, and I jumped in the air, but it was too late. And that SUV hit me, undercutting my legs. I don't know exactly how, complete flip, skidded across the pavement into the wet grass, sprawled out, glasses went flying, smashed, laying there. According to the usher who was out the front door, I laid there for several minutes unconscious without moving. But fortunately, I obviously came to, immediately ran in here, baptized Austin, came running out on the stage to deliver my sermon. Now, how many of you believe me with a show of hands? How many of you believe that happened? Not one person. There's one. John, I appreciate your trust in me, my friend. Not one of you believes me. He does, he's, just, he's even laughing about it. You know, <laughs> I don't believe you. You don't believe me. Now, why do you not believe me? I, it is not credible, is it? There is no evidence. There, there is no stain. There's no wounds. There's no bleeding. There's no evidence of concussion. That's super clear. Um, <laughs> glasses are not smashed. They seem to be fine. I mean, there's just, there's nothing about me. No limp. Nothing that would indicate that I was injured, and you would be right. There, there is nothing credible to what I am saying. Now, as Christians, we've been given eternal life by God himself. We've been transformed by the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in us, who is making us more like Jesus. And I just wonder if sometimes the world looks at us and says, really? Where's the, the conviction? You don't look and act any different than anyone else. It is through conviction, standing on the truth, that our message becomes credible to the world. Now, this truth that we have is not something that changes based on culture or based on preferences or based on what becomes common behavior, that the truth of God's word does not truth change. The truth of God's word, the scripture says, it is imperishable and it's enduring and it's living and it's forever and it's the foundation of our convictions. Our, our faith is not based on man-made opinions or religion. It doesn't change. It's based on God's word. And the question I'm asking is, does your life give evidence that you are a follower of Jesus? We're looking for evidence. Here a number of years ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, I just know I had kids in car seats. So, you know, there were four kids. We were in our town and country blue minivan. We were coming home from church after a Sunday night. The whole family, I'm driving. We're going from our church that was over on East Valley Watermill Road. And I'm on Valley Watermill Road, crossing over Glenstone. There's a pickup truck in front of me. And, and, and he suddenly decides he's going to turn into the gas station. So he makes kind of a sudden slowdown. Fortunately, we had enough distance. We slowed down. He turns into the gas station. We keep going. But as I'm heading down, descending the hill, I begin, I see he turns around and he comes like right behind me, like on our tail. He's following me. And I'm, I'm in my rearview mirror, I'm like, there's a dude following me. And we get to the bottom of the hill and we turn into our neighborhood, make another turn, make another turn, make another turn. And he's just right there on, our hill, on, on my tail. And I'm, go, I'm about to, I mean, we're at our home and I don't know what his intentions are or what's going on. So I decide, you know, I'm not turning into my driveway and showing him where my family lives. So I just keep driving and I drive around the golf course and he's just right there on my tail. I circle all the way back around to the gas station where this all began and he's still on my tail. And as any father does at this moment, when someone's behind you, your family's with you, you get into that protective mode. And uh, I was like, we're going to throw down right now. It's kind of where this was going. <laughs> And so I pulled into the gas station, and uh, the Holy Spirit was still working, I think. But I pulled in, I told Kim, lock the doors, and I got out, and I went right up as he was pulling in, and went up to his truck and said, how can I help you? And he said, you hit me back there. I said, what? He said, you hit me back there, and you kept driving, I was following you. I was like, I didn't hit you. He's like, yes, I did. He hit me. I'm, I'm going to... I, 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 I want to call the, he's wanting to call the police. I was like, I'll call the police. And so I got out, called the police, told the p gas attendants in there, will you keep your eye on this guy because there's something wacko going on. And uh, <laughs> went back outside. Sure enough, pretty soon an officer shows up and, he's, he's, and I get to talk first. And I said, this gentleman, as we were coming over, says I hit him. And uh, I don't know if there's something wrong or what's going on in his head, but 
Um, I didn't hit him, so you may want to check things out there at all. I wasn't even close to him. So he goes over there and talks to him for a little while. They come back, and he's looking at my van, and he asks, so Gemma, where, where do you think he hit you at? So we're all looking at my van, which is spotless, and he says, there's no damage of evidence, you know, damage here. And he's like, well, sure isn't. Let's go look at your truck. So we all go over, and we look at the man's truck. No, no evidence of damage on his truck. He's got one of those, uh, what do you call them, truck cabs on the back, the car, whatever it is, you just said it, whatever, that thing on the back. And uh, he's like, well, what do, what do you got in there? So they, they open it up. So we're all looking into the back of his truck, and there's a big metal toolbox. And it was all the way up against his glass there in his truck. He's like, well, usually that's sitting back here. That, well, you know, that must have slid and hit the back of my... And the officer said, I think we found what hit your truck, you know. And, and so he told me, you can go on. And so I left, and he spent some more time with the gentleman. We were on our way. But the point was, I didn't have any fear in that moment that somehow I was going to be falsely accused because I knew there was no evidence backing this up. I didn't hit that guy. I was nowhere near that guy. Now, there was another case where I did hit somebody, and, and I did get a ticket on that. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect. And that one, I was clearly at fault, and I took full responsibility and my insurance prices proved it. But, um, but on this occasion, I was in it. But demonstrating belief is just as important as belief itself. Demonstrating belief is just as important as belief itself. James says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. If, you're, if this is just in your head, some intellectual faith, but there is no action backing up, it's not real faith. It's not genuine faith. Belief itself, without real conviction, it's dead. Conviction demonstrates our belief, and it gives credibility to what we say. And so here's what Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 2.15. He says here in, in this following chapter, he says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. What he's saying here is that Christians were being slandered, and they were being told to government officials and to others that they were doing evil. And he's saying, you know what, chalk... Talk is cheap. You know what's, what's louder than talk is your actions. You live such good lives among them that you would silence their ignorant talk, their foolish talk. In other words, when behavior opposes what is being said, it is valid. But Peter goes on and gives us, gives us some more direction about how we live. This is now in chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. And he says here, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay the evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. <laughs> in other words, Peter makes it very clear. It's not just about conviction. It's not just about standing on truth. It's not just about showing it through the behavior of standing on truth. He goes on to say, also, you need to be compassionate. He continues the theme of, of loving our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Love one another. Be compassionate to one another. When you experience evil coming your way, respond to evil with blessing. Don't repay it with more evil. Show compassion to both those inside the church, but as he continues to talk here, obviously evil's coming from outside the church. Also, show compassion to those outside the church. You know what's going to get the world's attention more than even our conviction? It is our compassion. It is our love. You see, living with compassion makes the truth visible. Living with compassion makes the truth visible. This is what the early church did in the Roman Empire. When unwanted babies were discarded and left in the woods to die or to be eaten by wild animals, which was common in their culture, it was the Christians who were coming and taking those babies and bringing them into their homes. They were the foster parents. They were the ones adopting. They were the orphanages of that day. They were showing a love and a compassion that did not exist anywhere else. 
When women were devalued and considered property to be used and abused, it was the Christians who began to give them equal value and respect. Peter would even say such in his letter. Christians became known for their love. When a plague hit in the third century and thousands and thousands were dying alone because their families fled out of fear of catching the disease, it was the Christians who stayed and took care of the dying and they became known as the ones who take risk. Compassion for people speaks powerfully and it still does today. In a world that has a lot to say against Christianity, it is going to be our love and our compassion that gets the attention of this world. In a New York Times, uh, a New York Times editorialist, Nicholas Kristof, he wrote a column, and he was praising the work of many evangelical Christians. And here's what he says. He says, evangelicals are disproportionately likely to donate 10% of their income to charities, mostly church-related, more important They're disproportionately likely to go to the front lines at home or abroad in the battles against hunger, malaria, prison rape, obstetric fistula, human trafficking, or genocide. And he says, some of the bravest people you meet are evangelical Christians who truly live their faith. He says, I'm not particularly, listen to this, I am not particularly religious myself, but I stand in awe of those I've seen risking their lives in this way, and it sickens me to see that faith mocked at New York cocktail parties. He sees the compassion. He sees the love. He sees those taking risk. He sees that, and it speaks volumes to him. Now, you don't want to do that without the conviction. you got to have conviction, but it is the compassion that speaks to people. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he says, they will know you are my disciples by your what? It was by love. And sometimes we want to say, oh, love, that's so mushy and gushy. That's watering down the gospel. No, it's not. Not God kind of love. Not at all. They will know you're my disciples by your love. Love one another. He even says, this is the new command I give you. It is to love like this. Love like I've loved you. They're not going to know us by our beliefs. They're not going to know us by our convictions or our programs or our community service. Though All of that is great. They're going to know us by our love. Now, love can show itself in community service. Love can show itself in programs. It can show itself. But God-like love is where it's at. Empathy is what makes us cry and share in people's sorrow. It is compassion. That's what we do when the tears are dry. Compassion is what we do when the tears are dry. Compassion goes deeper than emotions. You may be moved by a story, moved by a situation. You may see hurt and hunger and helpless situations and be moved emotionally till you're physically sick. But compassion is what remains even when the emotions and tears are gone. And it is this compassion that Peter calls us to. <coughs> Just this week, I was talking to Kevin, and we were just talking about, you know, what are some examples of Northside's compassion? And I'm not going to have time to share all of these, but we were just talking about some of the stories that have just been happening recently. We thought of, of Leah in our youth ministry who used her birthday to make blessing bags, bags with toothpaste and toothbrush and soap and, and Kleenex and other things, and she's been giving those to homeless people. He, we thought of Allie, who was moved by a group of her friends to cut up old jeans and make them into shoes for an organization called Soul Care. We thought of the automotive company here in our church that performed work for free for a friend in our congregation who has cancer and is unable to provide for his family. It's the gentleman who's supporting another person in our church whose health crisis is preventing them from working and he's providing the support for their needs. That kind of compassion makes the greatest impact. And when it's compassion and conviction working together, that makes a huge impact. In 1 Peter 3, 15, Peter says this. He says, but in your hearts... Always set apart Christ as Lord. That's king. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You be prepared to stand on conviction and give a reason for this hope that you have in Jesus. But do this with gentleness and respect. Even when you engage in conversation with people and you're telling the reason for the hope you have in Jesus, you better do it with gentleness and respect. It's conviction with compassion. And when you're oppressed, do not repay evil for evil. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who are undergoing it. Respond to oppression and suffering. Not just with conviction, saying truth, 
but with compassion. Why would we do that? Why would we respond this way? Why would we live with the tension? Because it's a lot easier just to go one way or the other, frankly. It'd be a lot easier just to go with the compassion and go with the love without conviction, and we just love on everybody, and everything is, is just fine, and oh, you don't, have, don't worry about that, you don't have to believe that. It, oh, it doesn't matter what you do or how you live. Or we can just stand on conviction, and we can just shout out to everybody why they're wrong, and why we're right, and why this matters, and why this is truthful. Or we can have both, and live with the tension of that, which is messy, because sometimes you're going to feel like you're leaning too much on compassion. And sometimes you feel like you're leaning too much on conviction. And you just kind of wrestle with both. And sometimes you'll see other brothers and sisters. You think, man, they might be leaning too far this way. They might be leaning too far that way. But we live with the tension because we want to have both. And the reason we do that is because that's what Jesus did. Peter goes on to say this in 1 Peter 2, 23 to 24. He gives Jesus as our example. And he says, when they hurled their insults at him... He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You know what Jesus did when he encountered suffering and mistreatment and oppression and hardship? He entrusted them to the one who judges each one impartially. He entrusted them to the one who is the true judge. And he bore our sins on his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds we are healed. Jesus lived with truth and Jesus lived with compassion. And when you have the truth, when you've purified yourself by obeying the truth, you're going to have a sincere love for your brothers, the kind of love Jesus had for you. Because of that, we're going to go into a time of communion where we, we remember what Jesus did for us. And I'd like for our servers to be dismissed if you haven't yet and to go on to the back. And we're just going to sing together and prepare our hearts for what God's going to do in us. And as you take of communion today, as these trays are passed down your row, if you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, it's okay to let these trays pass because we respect your journey. But for all of us, we just want this to be a time where we reflect on His compassion, on His love, on His truth, so we might look like him. And so, Lord, we just pray right now that we could just set our hearts on you. We could fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, as we sing now, we are remembering who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.